Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage from ARUP, Tristram Carfrey. Thank you very much. And before I start, I'd like to thank Autodesk and the Real 2016 Conference for inviting me to come and speak to you. So I'm going to talk to you today about this church in Barcelona called Sagrada Familia. But before I begin, I must stress that the work I'm about to show you is a collaborative work between the Sagrada Familia themselves, who are their own architects, contractors, and procurers of the stone, and also a Spanish engineer called 2BMFG, and Arup, whom we are consultants to the Spanish engineering firm. So Gaudi started this church in 1880. In fact, it was started by somebody else whose name escapes me, but then he took over. And from the mid-80s through to when he died in 1926, he came up with three different styles of construction, as you can see here. The first, a sort of neo-Gothic, and then developed his own very different architecture, all designed around rural surfaces. So, you can see here the back of the nativity facade is in the original style. This was the early style, and everything that was built while Gaudi was still alive was actually in this style. It was only later construction that used the, um, the ruled surface style. In the crypt of the church, you can see this hanging chain model, which describes how the geometry of the structure was worked out so that everything was vertically load-bearing. So if you hang it to begin with and then turn it over, you get compression-capable stone, although this actually isn't Sagrada Familia. This was the design of a church at a place called Colonia Guel, just outside Barcelona. Only the crypt was constructed. The church itself was never constructed. And what the crypt shows you is that all the columns are non-vertical. They all lean inwards to eventually form this funicular shape, like a big parabolic dome in three dimensions. And Gaudi decided that wasn't what he wanted at, at Sagrada, so instead, he disciplined the church more, and we have a sort of a funicular shape across the nave, but with a regimented ranking of columns vertically down the nave to get more verticality into the construction. So, I'm getting confused as to what's on the screen. There we go, the video. So this is what we're, the challenge. The challenge is, it's taken us 130 years to build 60% of the church, and we're going to build the remaining 40% in 10 years. We're going to finish in 2026. So what we've had to do is cross-examine how it's built in a way to try and make it faster and cheaper, and also to use less site um, space, because as you complete the church, there's less and less site available to build the things in situ. So more and more we're building the things off-site prefabricating and bringing them to site and site assembling them, if you like. So we've, we're introducing new levels of technology to this ancient building and this ancient technique of making things in stone. In fact, for the last 35 or 40 years, most of Sagrada has been built in reinforced concrete because it was decided it had to be seismically resistant. The early stuff wasn't seismically resistant, but all the recent stuff is. So our trick was how do we do this? How do we make it faster, cheaper, off-site assembled, more authentic, and um, seismically resistant without using the reinforced concrete technique. It was quite labor intensive to make all the doubly curved formwork, to make all the reinforcement was hard work. And in particular, we looked at this tower here. This is the Mary Tower at the front of the church, and it sits on a crypt that was built in the 1880s and was never expected to hold a tower of this scale above it. So we also had to make it thinner so we're given only about 300 millimeters of skin in which to try and make a tower out of stone that worked. The geometry was preordained by Gaudi. This uh, model on the left was recovered from his works, most of which was destroyed in the Spanish Civil War. And this has been carefully and painstakingly pieced back together to describe these hyperbolic paraboloid shapes, which of course now is all script with rhino and, and grasshopper, so we can keep altering it slightly, but the basic parameters were predetermined. And it fell to us to say, well, can we make a structure out of stone that will work of this geometry under both wind loads and seismic loads and in a way that's manufactured? And this was my first attempt using um, 
an analysis or simulation package to say if it was all made of stone, would it stand up? And under an ordinary wind, it more or less works. But under an ultimate wind, which we also have to design for, it's really struggling. This thing's now got a lot of tension up the front face. It's moving a long way. It's probably cracked completely and is probably unstable. So that, that wasn't, we felt, a reasonable strategy. So what I'm describing here is a, this new way that structural engineers can approach problems by actually investigating in a simulation environment what happens and learn from that and take another step and another step and another step. In the old days, we had a strategy, a design that we'd probably construct on the back of an envelope or on the back of a napkin after a nice meal in a restaurant, and then we'd go and implement it. Now we're not doing that. We're considering what the possibilities are. So here, the next possibility is, can I make big panels and connect them together with mortar joints and have a structure that works? And that strategy turned out to be far more effective. So the next step is, OK, but I haven't really got these big cross brace panels. I've got skins of stone in, in, in um, an inverted curvature with triangular windows. Do they work? So we can look at that instead and say, well, actually, the red here, by the way, is tension, which stone can't carry. And the green is compression. So this is the stresses you get under wind. And again, that's not going to work. But if instead we pre-stress it, by which I mean we put rods of steel through the stone and we pre-stress it, pre-tension it, or pre-compress the stone, thinking about it the other way around, you get a compression field, which when you add to the tension field before, you're more or less OK. Everything now is in compression under the service wind. Under the ultimate wind, the, the wind we never expect to have happen, but we design for, you can get quite large amounts of tension around the heads of the window. So is that a problem? Is it not a problem? Will it relieve itself through cracking? Or will it get worse? So we simply take the elements out, as you can see where these blue circles are, and say, have I still got a structure? In this case, the answer is yes, because actually it still goes in compression around the end of that crack, and it's still going to behave itself. So that was the strategy we adopted. And then we went into a proof of concept and said, can we make it? So we, we make some stone blocks. We pre-stress them together. And the whole team is very happy, because this panel has been made in a day. And the reinforced concrete equivalent was taking a week. So it's quite sort of odd that this using old-fashioned techniques of stone and cutting it to size is faster than a modern technique of using concrete. Then the question is, it's a natural material. Does it behave the way we've predicted? Is our simulation accurate? Can we rely upon it? So we then load the, um, the proof of concept model and check that it behaves in the way we expect it to, particularly under those extreme stresses I showed you earlier. And luckily, it does. And then we face with reality. And reality is that Sagrada has bought all these stone blocks at a time when they thought they were using them to face concrete. And now we're using them structurally. So has all the stone that they have bought and stockpiled actually going to work? Is it strong enough to do the job that we want it to do? Luckily, the answer to that is yes, too. And then we have to make it. Now, on the left, I'm sorry I haven't got a better picture of this. That's a computer-controlled bandsaw that can, with a rotating table underneath it, cut any ruled surface you want. It has to be ruled because the saw blade is straight, but it can be oriented and moved in space as it cuts to make anything you like, like the block on the right. And then the bit I particularly love is this, that when you've finished making a computer controlled accurate to a millimeter stone block, you then have it finished by hand okay, to make the actual thing that you want. So it's the skill of the craftsman in the end that's the important bit. And you just, just wait for a moment. And in a moment, you'll see him change his hammer and really go to town. This is just preparatory work at the moment, the delicate bit, OK, before you go for it. But I, and on the right, you can see that when he's finished, it's then compared with a cardboard template, something that's probably been in use by stonemasons you know, for more than 1,000 years. So we've got this wonderful mixture of computer-controlled cutting equipment being driven directly from a Rhino model, this hand finishing. Come on, get the other hammer. Here we go. This is, this is the good bit, right? OK, so that, that's how you make a church in the modern world. Okay? And actually, it's, it, it, for me, this is the richest design experience I've ever had in terms of the number of different techniques and approaches that we've used. So a lot of it's still sketching. It's still the usual way of having dialogue in workshops with lots of people in the room. Then we've also got lots of um, 3D models, both virtual, as you can see on the left, approximate models, photorealistic models. Rapid prototypes, every time we have a workshop, there's a whole new set of physical models to look at at, at model scale. 
We do um, analysis models. So this is about erecting the, the, the um, panels. How do we put them together? Do they fit? Do we get stresses during erection that are more than we can conceive of? And good old-fashioned physical models to test out erection methodology. There's nothing like seeing it in the flesh to make you think about how it gets put together. And on the right there is a model which is actually each stone is a rapid prototyping model of its own. And then it's strung together with little steel rods. And you can just see at the bottom the socket used to tighten it up to emulate what we're going to do you know, in reality. And there are, of course, cartoons. There's nothing like a cartoon to describe in a way to other people what it is that you want. So all these different processes are being run in parallel and together in a sort of, chaotic's not quite the word, but a rich mixture of information. Then on site, this is a lintel block. It's the big block that goes across the top of the panel. Um, these steel pieces you see are all accurately glued with epoxy glue into holes. This is the most delicate bit structurally, because these, when you pre-stress it, these tend to burst the stone. And so all of these have to be accurately made. They've got curved surfaces and glued in, and then we hydraulically pre-stress the rods. And here you see the actual prototype of the tower itself. So before it was a proof of concept, this is putting together real pieces to see if they fit together. We are getting one millimeter tolerance on the fit up between stone panels after it's been put together. And the piece we're looking at at the moment is the, what's called the, um, the nucleus or the core in the main Jesus Tower. So this church, when it's finished, by the way, is 170 meters tall, tallest church in Europe. And uh, the nucleus going up the middle of the main tower is in itself 60 meters tall with a spiral staircase cantilevering inwards from the stone core. That's quite a challenge, particularly because there are a lot of big openings in that stone core, and therefore we have to cantilever a stair from nothing as it passes the windows. So again, we're post-tensioning the stair, as you can see on the right there, with, with steel rods inside the staircase to keep it connected together as it cantilevers off nothing. And again, we're at the proof of concept stage, and I love the fact that for some reason, the first assembly of the stairs upside down, I haven't quite worked out why, but obviously it was just easier to support it off the flat surfaces than off the, off the continuously curving surface. But that's where we're at with this bit of the project. They're about to put the rods in and, and post-tension it as we speak. And then what's left is the core itself. And it's the most difficult thing because we've decided not to post-tension this completely, but to build it as conventional masonry. And then to only add rods where it's absolutely necessary but then this has to work in an earthquake. So it doesn't experience the wind loads because it's inside the tower, but it does have to work in an earthquake. So we're using um, finite element models that we developed for a, another project, which looks at unreinforced masonry and how does it behave in an earthquake, and it models all these flexing and sliding and cracking that you can get using a nonlinear analysis program. So on the left there is our, our theoretical model. On the right at the bottom is the results of a real scale model of a, a exactly the same wall made of bricks. And the top right is pushing it and pulling it. And you can see that the blue and the, the red lines, one is theoretical, one's real. There's a pretty good correspondence. And hopefully this shows you what happens as an earthquake comes along. So all that, that's what we're trying to model for the middle of Sagrada Familia and predict whether this core will work without any reinforcement. So that's it. That's where we're at. This is where we're at today on site. This is Sagrada Familia as of a year ago. This is what it's like inside. And I've got to tell you that for me as a structural engineer, nothing could make me happier than bringing all the tools and techniques we can get today to help finish this fantastic church. Thank you. Now, I'm not sure of the procedure, because I saw on the program that there's five minutes for questions and answers. Is that available to me or not? One question. Would anybody like to ask a question? Yes. Um, yes, but never quite enough. So I personally worked on, by the way, the question was, are there other projects we'd 
worked on or seen before that gave us confidence that these techniques might work. And for me personally, I was involved with a, um, a project for the Seville Expo in 1990 called the Pavilion of the Future, where we used post-tension stone, but in that case, all the rods doing the post-tensioning were outside the stonework and connected to the stone arches, not inside the stonework. And then there was another project we did with Renzo Piano called um, Padre Pio in Rome, where we're using a combination of external post-tensioning and internal post-tensioning. But I've never done these kind of anchorages before, because in this case, we wanted to keep it all concealed. So it's the steel blocks inside the stone and the way they interact with the stone, which is the critical element. But we will be testing them. <laughs> Thank you very much.